Oh my god. Oh my god. of the United States, and it's got everything, I think, but the last, uh, it's got the Article 26, Amendment 26, passed in 71. I think they're at 28 now. So this is an old book from like 1980. I yeah, think the, la the last one is related. It's like what, like a pay payment uh, to members of Congress, something like that. Yeah. And it was one that languished around for 200 years or something. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. When I was looking at that, uh, well, uh, that that's a uh, we didn't even have to introduce any further, right? Maybe that's a good enough uh, introduction, right? So, Dan Schneider has uh, his uh, pocket constitution. I have uh, some stuff pulled up as well, but we're going to be talking about Roe v. Wade. Um, this might make for an interesting discussion, simply because uh, I think Dan and I somewhat disagree uh, specifically about Roe v. Wade. We don't disagree, obviously, about abortion, right? We're both. Uh, 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 I'm not sure if Dan believes this, but I, I believe that abortion ought to be allowed pretty much to the day of life birth, right? Anything to oh, see that. I do. Yeah. Too. So, and, and that's the thing. So, I mean, I mean, uh, I've so I've somewhat softened a little bit on Roe v. Wade in the last few weeks. We first wanted to record this a few weeks ago, and I've been reading more and more simply because uh, what Dan and I uh, have just said, that's not an opinion that is shared by almost anybody in the world, right? Uh, even in like the most liberal sort of uh, abortion environment, such as in Russia, it has some of the most liberal, more liberal than America, even uh, uh, during Roe v. Wade. But um, uh, most places, right, they, they probably, and most people, they would say, oh, I, I don't agree with uh, uh, being allowed to do an abortion on like month eight and a half, right? But Dan and I, uh, we, we do take that position. And the, the reason why I take that position is also the reason why I have like issues with how Roe v. Wade was originally decided, right? So there was... Um, uh, uh, there, there was just from the very beginning, right? This emphasis on privacy, and even uh, when I was like a kid and I was formulating my early political opinions, and you know, I, I came out on the side of uh, abortion activists. It never struck me as very obvious how privacy was used to uh, allow abortion access, right? Like it, it, it didn't seem very intuitive to me. It still doesn't, right? I can think of like a dozen different things that I would invoke uh, prior to invoking privacy. Although I understand how privacy works into it, I don't think that's necessarily the be-all, end-all. But then again, the reason why I'm uh, softening a little bit is because you know, it, it was a good sort of in-between state, right? It was a good compromise between the people who do, for example, believe like me that, okay, abortion should be allowed to the very end versus most people who believe that uh, there needs to be some restrictions. And that was more or less the gist of the Roe v. Wade argument. Um, and, and that's sort of how it introduced it. We're going to build on this little by little as the conversation goes on. So why don't you take it from here, Dan, and maybe e either, either give like a, a, a wide sort of like a scope of the, of the issue or maybe get in immediately in your sort of, a, um, you know, experiences with uh, abortion and stuff brought back when it was illegal. Well, I, I, th I think the first thing, and we can talk about my childhood when I was pre-row, I can talk about taking some girls to abortion clinics in the 80s when I was a teenager, uh, can talk about the Bible and what it says, it doesn't say not that it's constitutionally relevant, I can talk about, uh, you know, things, things, for example, like in 50 years, uh, fetuses will be able to be raised mm -hmm. extra utero. So you have to, you have to, some of the things that we're talking about bodily autonomy, which apply now, may not apply then. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, I wanted to start from from basically from the beginning and, and looking at uh, at the amendments to the Constitution. I think there are six amendments that clearly uh, uh, give a woman a, a right to an abortion, and, and I want we'll go through them. I want to just read them and explain them just simply uh, one by one. The first is the First Amendment, and that was uh, all the first ten amendments were passed by Congress September twenty fifth, seventeen eighty nine and ratified by three quarters of the states, December 15, 1791. So Article 1 or Amendment 1, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it talks about speech, the free press. So right there in the first two clauses, the establishment of religion. When we talk about abortion, it is always under a religious context. There is zero medical scientific credibility that a fetus 
uh, and 98% of uh, abortions occur before the first 12 weeks, I believe, or maybe it's the first 15 weeks. And all, you know, if, if you could just Google, Alex, Google a photograph of any random woman and Google an eight to 12 week old fetus. And you tell me what the difference is between mm -hmm. that. So the only, the only thing there is uh, a large portion of it is uh, religious groups uh, that claim that God somehow is against abortion regardless. Now, that's not so. We can talk about the one mention of the Bible, one possible mention. I've got the passage uh, there. But so clearly it violates uh, uh, the religious freedom or lack of religion. If you're an atheist or your religion uh, wants to allow abortion or has no uh, claim on it, it violates uh, number one. So the second one is well, let, 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 well, let's take these uh, piece by piece, right? Otherwise, we're just gonna have like a huge like list uh, to deal with after. So um, I, I was actually thinking. So like I, I knew Dan was gonna uh, talk about the amendments. And I was thinking, like, would he talk about the First Amendment? Uh, you know, there's a religion aspect. There's also the possibility of you know speech, maybe in some ways, like if only in the sense that uh, like being forced to pass on your own genetic material that seems a uh, very very strange to me right and it's well, going to be speech, the speech yeah. element can come in now with uh states like texas and uh, yeah, Idaho, yeah. uh wanting to track people uh and, and get uh get uh their unencrypted mm -hmm. uh, information uh, yeah. and whatnot so there that would also be a violation of, of free speech and a clear violation clear violation the right to privacy for example which uh, we'll get to in a, uh, a later amendment. Uh, there were no, there were no telephones, much less mm -hmm. cell phones, much less texting, much less, uh, not even telegrams, not even telegraph. Uh, when this was, uh, this was uh, uh, first ratified in 1791. So the idea that there was a right to privacy is inherent. And if we can say, and if the government can say that you need to get a judge to sign off to wiretap Al Capone's phones, for example, or John Gotti or whomever, there is an establishment of privacy there and it's implicit within. But uh, anyway, go ahead with what your point yeah. was. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of enforcement, right, uh, speech is part of it, right? Uh, we're going to probably see more and more of this, uh, uh, given how enforcement is going to play, play out in the next few years. Um, but also, just, again, just the idea of that of being forced to pass on your genetic material, your genetic information. There's going to be, you know, in the next few decades, uh, uh, speech rights uh, codes and stuff like that surrounding just this uh, passage of genetic information, uh, whether or not, um, you know, you, you have the right to this genetic information, what gets done with it. So I think that's going to become more and more obvious as time goes on. Um, and it's but, medical information. This exactly, the, yeah. The way, the, the way the Supreme Court is doing it, they 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 would if they if, if, if uh, under Dobbs, HIPAA becomes invalid because mm -hmm. because the government uh, can then go in and get your medical records or a woman's medical records. You know, yeah. And, you know, so I mean, it 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 would invalidate the HIPAA laws. Yeah, and, and specifically uh, on religion, you know, th the thing that really gets me about this entire conversation is I can imagine uh, people saying, well, no, it has nothing to do with religion. I'm an atheist and I'm against uh, abortion, blah, blah, Like, I, there's definitely like a person like that out there. But the fact is, like, when you sort of see what either historically America has done in terms of treating uh, abortion as a as a criminal act, or even what what like you know popular conservatives today say. So like you know Ben Shapiro is is perhaps one of the most uh, popular conservatives, um, uh, yeah, at least among the internet or whatever. And uh, he says this very funny thing where he has videos where he insists like abortion is murder, abortion is murder, abortion is murder, right? That's a baby, that's a baby, that's a baby. He says that over and over again. And yet when he's pressed on questions like, so what would you do with a woman that illegally gets an abortion? Would you charge her with murder and possibly execute her? You know, he he, he starts uh, trying to build all these workarounds like, well, you know, uh, culturally it's still kind of accepted. So you can't really hold, you know, uh, a people People, you know, to, to those kinds of standards. And I think that kind of shows everything, doesn't it? Like, this isn't ever really about, you know, preserving human life. This is more so about controlling in, in, women. 
Yeah, and <laughs> specifically in the case of Ben Shapiro, to say that women cannot be held accountable like they're infants, right? They can't be held accountable for look, literal look, murder. If that's because in your system it is murder, right? Look at how the anti-vaxxers took the my cho- body, my choice. It's my yeah. body, my choice when you don't want to get a vaccine or don't want to wear a mask. Uh, the the right wing, they, they are so big on the Second Amendment. And I, I nominally am for the Second Amendment. I think you should be able to carry a gun if you're in a high crime area or if you're going out legally hunting. There's a difference between that, though, and being able to shoot down a 747. But there is not a single man, especially not a single white man in this country that would ever see any part of their body to the government if, if they mm-hmm. if, the government, if the government outlawed tattooing yeah how many bikers would descend upon washington dc and raise it to the ground it would mm-hmm. it would make january 6th look like a party for three-year-olds yeah and 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 also like when you look at the history of laws right about abortion even those that would uh, uh criminalize abortion there was never ever uh i can't think of a single situation where a woman was in fact charged with something like murder right it has never happened i think the closest was like a woman had to like spend some months in jail sometime in the 60s or maybe early 70s before Roe, but it was like considered extremely controversial, right? So uh, again, like based on everything surrounding all the legal context, nobody in fact believes that a fetus is in fact, uh, let's not say human being, right? But has the same level of personhood as for example, an infant, a two-year-old, or even a monkey, right? I I, I would be able to make a better case for the personhood uh, for like a 10-year-old chimp than I could for a zygote, right? Um, well, so- I, I, I would disagree with even calling that a human being. It's human tissue. It, mm-hmm. it, that's what it is. The, uh, the vast majority, when we're talking the eight to 12 week, week range, there, there's no functioning brain that can distinguish pain, that can, dis- that can, that can make thoughts. Uh, there's barely a heart, a big deal, a heartbeat. Is, is it an autonomous being? People will slaughter animals to eat them. They will kill insects without any thought. And, you know, your average insect, whether we're talking a praying, a large praying mantis down to a, a typical ant, is about the size of a fetus from zero to eight to 12 mm-hmm. weeks. Any, any, even an ant, a social insect that, that is guided by chemical forays, can defend itself, it can eat, it can hunt, it can excrete, uh, it can do all of these things that make it an autonomous being, even though it's part of what's no, colloquially known as a super organism. Same thing with the bee. A praying mantis has more right to life, so to speak, than a, than a fetus. Oh my God, Dan, Dan hates and, and and that's literally true. That's literally true. In some places, if you kill a praying mantis, you might be fined thousands of dollars. That's not going to happen, right, if you abort a fetus. So that's literally true. Irrespective of what people might feel about this, it's literally true. And it has been, you know, throughout history um, in, in different kinds of, uh, you know, situations. But l- let's actually sort of uh, keep in mind this person argument as later on we return to Roe. Um, and then we just move uh, through the end uh, of these amendments. So like, what's the next amendment? You have the next amendment that uh, applies uh uh as i said number one was the separation of church and state and the bulk 95 percent plus i would say of people who are against abortion do so on on religious not medical grounds article four amendment number four the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue a but upon probable cause, supported by oath affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched or the person or things to be seized. Well, right there, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, if we talk about personhood, is a woman a person? Now, if we don't, if we say they either are or not, if they are, they are secure in their person, which means their physical limit. This is this is one of the places where the, the right to privacy uh, uh, is, is often pointed to. Uh, are they a person or not? The only way that by reading that, when when they say the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, effects, you could say their person or, or their body, you know, their person, if you want to talk about it being a spiritual thing, but their effects, their things, what is, what is more essential to personhood than someone's body? So mm-hmm. right there, forget even calling it a right to privacy. It states it right there. The right of the people to secure in their persons and their effects. This has to mean 
uh, the body. What else could it mean? I mean, we, we in 17, 1789, 91, when this was proposed and ratified by the states, you know, they, we didn't know about medical knowledge. They would, you know, this is one of the things with the Constitution. They are using the language of the 18th century. We are now in the 21st century. If we were to rewrite this the way we, you know, have, have now the the new uh, revised version of the Bible versus the King James version, it would it would read quite differently and different words would be used. But right there, is a woman a person or not? You know, was a slave, are we going to make women three-fifths of a person the way we did with blacks uh, in the 19th century? Are they full? If they are fully persons, they have the right right there in Article 4, Amendment 4. Yeah. And uh, what I would say about that is I can imagine, you know, someone objecting like, well, it specifically has to do with probable cause in relation to a crime being committed. If abortion is a crime, there could be probable cause. But the fact is abortion being labeled uh, a crime in the first place, right, would be a violation of the uh, Fourth Amendment to begin and unreasonable with. Unreasonable right? search. Yeah. This again, goes back to the modern stuff. Do they have the right to go through cell phones or computers or emails or, or whatnot? Why is that unreasonable if you are secure in your person and effects? Again, this, I mean, this this right, I, I, it, it couldn't be more clear that any individual has the right to be secure in their person. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that has to be uh, re referenced in the body. We can talk about unreasonable searches, but, you know, What's more unreasonable than to try to dig into someone's bedroom? You know, this is this is this again, and this is going to apply with gay marriage when that's one of the next things that's on their target. Uh, who has a right to to know what people do in their bedroom? You know, if if uh, if I want to uh, fuck some uh, girl who's at least of age, that's no one's business. You might think, oh, Dan's fifty-seven and he's fucking a twenty-two-year-old. Yeah, it might be kind of weird and gross, and it's not something that I could ever see myself mm -hmm. doing, even if I were not married. But as long as the people are of age and they are fully person and fully uh, uh, of the majority, I th there's there's really nothing unless someone is being forced to do something. If someone is forcing an abortion on someone, if a husband and, and his goons. Don't want to, re you know, gets his friends to take the woman to, to a doctor's office and want to forcibly rip the fetus out. That's a different story. But shy of that, which if it's ever happened once or twice in American history, I doubt it. But if it's ever happened, that would you, you can make an argument should be illegal, but not for the person to make the decision on their person. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. Um, and, and I mean, so far, right, we haven't uh, uh, touched on the privacy arguments of uh, of Roe, right? Which again, it, it sort of calls into question why is necessarily that tack is the one that was taken, but let, let's continue in the list. Okay, so the next one would be number nine. Article nine, amendment nine. The enumeration, meaning the spelling out in words, in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others uh, disparage others retained by the people. So basically, the uh, the whole idea of originalism is just gutted right here by the Ninth Amendment. This mm -hmm. idea, they are basically stating that uh, just because we say that you have, at that point with 10 amendments, maybe you could construe, let's say, 71 individual rights. They are basically saying, we're not that smart. We know that people in the future are going to derive things from it. So mm -hmm. uh, this is what's called unenumerated rights. And this is another thing that, that's key to abortion. It wasn't part of Roe versus Wade, but this is another part of it. Just in, in other words, unless something is outlawed, uh, you know, uh, unless slavery, is, for example, slavery is an interesting thing uh, in terms of uh, this argument, because uh it never, it never really talked about slavery until the amendments that abolish slavery here. So mm -hmm. people would argue the state's rights uh, superseded the individual blacks' rights because they were only three-fifths of, of a person. But basically it's saying that unless you specifically say no, 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 you can do it. That's what yeah. number nine says. 
Um, there's a ton of like conservative arguments uh, these days about whether or not um, unenumerated uh, rights even exist, right? Which is just kind of, I mean, it, it's ridiculous in the face of it. Right. And it just, sh it's it's not even, that's the thing. It's not even a conservative argument, right? You could just, you you could see how in fact, it's one of those truly radical right-wing things. It's, it's completely off the liberal conservative axis, right? In the sense that they're just trying to chop away actual, you know, like fundamental principles like that, that even are are found in the constitution right for the sake of um and also just like projecting outward this idea of like well you're just uh you know you're just doing judicial activism when in fact you know this is essentially what they're doing right and what they have been doing from the very beginning and, and also like it's, it's just sort of obvious that you can't escape judicial activism uh as a rule right that's uh, just kind of like a, one of the most important ways in which things actually happen things move forward new understandings are, are established but um and you know they're doing the trying to do the same thing by axing this idea of unenumerated rights well number nine basically states that the only way you could outlaw abortion is to get an amendment to outlaw abortion mm -hmm. you need to have have uh uh what is it the whole let me see uh first amendment passed. so congress would have to pass it in both houses and then you need three quarters of the states which would be now what uh, three quarters would be 37 38 states you need yeah. you need basically have 38 out of the 50 states uh and that that ain't gonna happen. Um, but uh, again, it, it's right there. So I don't know if you want me to go on to the next one. Uh, yeah, we'll go on, on to the next. So Article 10, Amendment 10, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited uh, by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, this is, this is an interesting one, and it goes to uh, the use of a of commas. Uh, the the right wing would state that uh, not prohibited by the states, the powers not prohibited by the states are reserved to the states, meaning that the states would have the right to regulate it. But then it says, or to the people. So what are we talking about there? Are we talking about uh, that uh, the, the states have the right to, to outlaw things for their citizens? Or the power, because how you read it, you could you could take out these clauses and and, and just read it because nor prohibited by, by it to the states or reserved to the states respectively could be t seen just as a qualifier to the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution uh, or are reserved to the states or to the people. So that comma there, are we, uh, I would argue, and a lot of people would argue, that what it's saying there is that the states can do those things, but those, those powers that aren't delegated are also reserved to the people, not the people of the states in a political sense, but to individuals. And because there is a comma there, uh, the states respectively comma, or to the people, you there's an argument that we're talking about the people directly, uh, individual voters. And keep in mind, in 1791, this was the foundation for the big argument that caused the Civil War, the rights of the individual versus the rights of the states. What the right wing is, what did the Confederates always say? Uh, we're for states' rights, but if we look at it, you can see that as being a pro-states' rights uh, uh, claim or a pro-individual claim, because uh, uh, the powers not delegated nor prohibited by the states are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Uh, I would argue, uh, since the, the whole of the Constitution is about individual rights, that it's, it's basically sta stating that the states can regulate some of these things like interstate traffic. So we're talking about, it's what it's not saying here, it's not pitting the states versus the individual rights. That comma is separating. You have some states' rights like interstate commerce, which, which has, has long been acknowledged, and individual rights. So I would say my argument would be one, two, the third comma in that amendment is, di is differentiating states' rights versus individual rights. It's not saying that the state's rights, because it's stated first, supersede that of the people. Uh, do you know off the top of your head uh, whether in the Constitution uh, the phrase the states has ever been conflated with like a phrase like the people, right? That, that That's also a possibility, but I, I, I'm not sure how, you know, this, this functions yeah, um, I, throughout. I, I would say historically, if you're looking back, because this was the schism that led to, to the states' rights versus the individual rights, um, I would I would argue, and this is number ten, so this is the last of the the Bill of Rights. Um, too, 
uh, it, it's interesting because when the Bill of Rights ends, Article 10, or to the people, the last mm -hmm. words of the Constitution in 1791, as it was drafted, was to the people or the people. So mm -hmm. I would argue that this is, is the very last words of the document that is stating the individual reigns supreme, at least in the terms of individual rights. Yes, there are things like, you know, you can't uh, stand up in a movie theater, even though there weren't movie theaters, but any kind of public place and yell fire and, and cause harm that way. But but I would argue the very fact that the Constitution, and when I go right back to the very beginning here, we the people, and it en it ends to the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, so I, I would say if you're an originalist, as the right wing claims, it is. It starts with the people. It ends with the people, in in Amendment Ten. So go ahead, your comments. Um, I, I don't have too much on that, but do you have comments on uh, uh, Amendment Thirteen? Because I think that's an interesting one, depending on how you define certain that's, things. That's 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 what we're gonna hit next. Number yeah. 13, so 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 may, maybe let me just start with this one. Uh, so Thirteenth Amendment, right? Uh, obviously abolishes slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. And uh, th this sort of reminds me of this conversation that we were uh, maybe supposed to have. I remember like a couple of years ago, you wanted to do an abortion thing with uh, some uh, Catholic uh, uh, woman who was like just a, a writer on these questions. And I was looking at some of her essays and she was constantly making this argument that uh, uh, with the introduction of abortion, once it became kind of like, you know, very f free to, to get, it, it introduced like another level of the sexual objectification of women right where because there weren't you know these kinds of consequences uh men feel that they could sort of objectify a woman as they please and it, to me it's a funny argument uh largely because if you get rid of abortion right because you believe it's uh, a form of sexual objectif objectification or rather makes it more easy well, you're just replacing one form of objectification with another. Granted, this isn't if you make abortion illegal, it's not the sort of objectification where like, uh, you know, a, a woman is like paraded around and sort of uh, ogled or, or however you want to look at that form of objectification. But it does turn a woman into like a sort of like self necessitating like baby factory, right? Isn't that, you know, just another kind of objectification? Why are the stakes of that objectification in any way lower uh, than, than, you know, what else is being described? So if, you, if, if you're going to tell a woman that she has to simply by having sex, right? Imagine also like if she's like 45 years old and she's already had like her kids are off in college and you tell her essentially, no, no, no. You can't have sex for fun because if you do and you get pregnant, you have to now relive the last 20 years of your life all over again and send uh, off another nest of children to college, right? Um, th that is very much a form of servitude, right, against her wishes. That is definitely a form of slavery, however you want to define it. So it it's just objectification of a different sort. Well, it would be akin to a quote-unquote white slavery or forcing women into sexual slavery now i have issues with with a lot of that uh but that's that that's mostly outside the united states so that doesn't really pertain here but yeah neither slavery nor involuntary except as punishment for a crime so uh they a lot of them would argue well if we outlaw abortion then we can uh take away that right in the 13th amendment but but that that's put that's putting the horse before the cart uh clearly as I stated, there are four other articles that precede this in the Bill of Rights. This, mm -hmm. this I mean, even the old fellows, the, their founding fathers, uh, four out of their ten amendments, forty percent of their of their uh, 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 Bill of Rights, uh, the amendments, pertain to the individual. Now, yes, they didn't follow it, obviously, because you know, thirteen and fourteen deal with the uh, uh, removal of slavery. But yeah, and I, if. It, what is slavery? If you look at the definition, uh, slavery is is where one person controls the life and actions of another person. Is a master. I don't. The only if you remove the right to abortion, the state then becomes de facto slavers. There's no other way a, a, around that, and that's illegal. So uh, uh, again, you know, putting aside even the medical stuff, since we're dealing with only one individual. We're not dealing, you know, it's not like the fucking term, uh, what, not the, what was that movie on Mars with Arnold Schwarzenegger where the guy has a total belly recall. inside his belly. Total you know, recall, it's not yeah. like the fetus can come out and say, you know, I have a right 
to this or whatnot. That I mean, I, I think it's clearly Article uh, 13, Amendment 13, clearly uh, uh, basically says that human beings, and again, th that, that was in direct response, not only to slavery, but to the free fisting, that they are fully uh, endowed persons. Um, so uh, if I can go on to Article 14, which is basically just a corollary, and this this is this is at the point the, lo the longest amendment. So uh, I'll just you know uh, Section One is the one that really pertains here. The rest have to do with public debt and uh, you know the uh, the who who can be a, a public official. So Section One of Amendment 14, which was again uh, 1866, 1868, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law that shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This was, again, uh, pertaining to blacks, uh, freed blacks in the Reconstruction era that came just right after this was uh, ratified. But clearly, uh, again, it has to apply to women too, because uh, the no state shall make a law that will abridge the privilege of the immunities of life, liberty, or property without the due process of life, liberty, or property. So we, these are already covered by the amendments there. So I, I, I would argue that, that basically 13 and 14 are, are twin amendments that even though they were uh, do uh, made for uh, people uh, of color uh, on racial grounds, it has to apply to women, white women, black women, uh, all women equally. And so those last two, I think, just basically uh, are reaffirming what the first four ones that we talked about in the original Bill of Rights stated, that women are persons, that they have the right to control their bodies, uh, that the state has no right to, to put anyone into any kind of slavery, be it racial or sexual. And uh, I mean, so six out of now, well, there were 28 amendments still. That's a, a pretty good portion. That's almost a quarter uh, of uh, uh, the amendments, uh, again, to the individual. And there are other ones to individual rights, but not pertinent that I see of unless, unless you saw some other amendments. Um, not really, but perhaps we could end on the 14th because this is a specifically what uh, Roe v. Wade uses to argue for uh, abortion protections, right? Um, it, it sort of looks into, specifically it looks at the due process clause, right? And it makes an argument uh, for pri pri for privacy like it, it, in a couple of ways. So first of all, there's – um. Like if you read the entire decision, there's this kind of like a, a long description of abortion laws dating back to uh, maybe starting with the Roman era. Perhaps it could even be before. And the reason why that is done is just in general, uh, whether it's like international law, um, you know, like in terms of like agreed upon international laws or how laws are treated by individual uh, states around the world. Uh, or how America and the UK have treated laws, right? They all they always look to some sort of precedence, right? It, it, and it could be, you know, just outside of uh, the, the scope of their own system. So there isn't anything weird about Roe v. Wade uh, trying to uh, att attempt that. Later on, it gets into the 1800s, how abortion restrictions were kind of, uh, they existed, but they were inconsistent, Right. Um, uh, specifically, the uh, uh, the punishments right for abortions were never, you know, ones of like, you know, this is murder. Right. So already from the beginning. Right. We have the sense that abortion is, is clearly something very different from taking the life of, you know, a newborn or, or like a grown man or like uh, what have you. Right. Um, but it, it rests kind of like uh, almost wholly on the idea of privacy as it exists or as it's implied in, in the 14th Amendment. And it doesn't really invoke anything like uh, uh, the part of the 14th Amendment uh, for, um, you know, uh, what, is, what is the specific name of the clause? Uh, yeah, the Equal Protection Clause. Um, there's nothing really about bodily autonomy. Uh, Roe does this thing where on the one hand, it's 
It's trying to avoid establishing, you know, this idea of personhood, whether or not, you know, this is a, a human life, right? It's saying that this is kind of like the, the realm of perhaps science or philosophy. And yet it does establish like a, a, a trimester timetable, right? Where uh, after, um, you know, like a third trimester, you, you can't, you can't uh, have abortions, right? Uh, second tri starting with the second trimester, perhaps like some states maybe could have arguments for, uh, uh, um, you know, they, they they basically have a right to uh, not not maybe get rid of abortion, but regulate how they're done, regulate some laws around it. And not once do I see anything about like a, a woman's autonomy, right? Only to the extent that, well, she has like the, f the freedom to a certain kind of privacy, but it's never couched in terms of the body, right? Well, what, you're, what, what you're basically arguing is that they didn't take full advantage of what they should have. They they only put up one block. Yes, of the yes exactly. Rather than yes. using the six and and, and 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 one that is kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people, including me, who is very sympathetic, obviously, to abortion. I it, it still is a little bit counterintuitive to me to base abortion rights around privacy, right? And and if people who are not me, I'm sure they they feel this way even more. Well, see, I don't. I don't. I th I think I think. The people who say that it was a bad law, even even, even you'll get some uh, what what I would call you know what they would call rhino, uh, what dino type people, Democrats in name all, or, or even though I'm not big on Democrats, people who would say oh it it, it was poorly argued. Well, no, I don't. I think I think I think there are plenty of cases that have been decided on one aspect uh, of uh, constitutional uh, guarantees. Uh, so I, I don't think that's bad law. I think it would have been better had they had they uh, tied this all together because then you'd need a whole domino effect. And and if you base it on all six of the, the types of ways you can look at abortion in these six amendments, then basically the Supreme Court would basically have to be, it would be obvious that they were rogue and didn't give, give a damn. Here, they're trying to be technocrats and whatnot. And we know goddamn well that not a single one of these motherfuckers gives a right rat's ass about rights. Certainly the, the least of them amazingly, is probably fucking Clarence Thomas. Um, but you have to understand, and this is for people who might be viewing this outside the United States. 1820, do you know the Dartmouth decision, Alex? No, what is that? That, that is the decision that gave corporate personhood. So the same courts that said that Negroes, Black people, were only three-fifths of a person, they said that legally... Co any corporation was a full person. You know, I hope one of the things that comes, it, it'll probably take 10, 15 years to, to, to get abortion rights back to where they were. Uh, I would, I would, I would get the people who got the gay marriage rights. These people knew what they were doing, uh, but to just blast them, it'll take that time to get this stuff back. And now I forgot my point, but uh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you mentioned the uh, the Dartmouth de decision, how you know uh, corporations could be given essentially like you know bodily rights, right? Um, but clearly, uh, they're saying that this is not so applicable uh, outside of that, right? Women clearly uh, are not uh, given that. Um, and again, it, it's it's just one of those things where, given the way that it was decided, uh, I definitely see like avenues for it being overturned, right? And it's not just me saying that. I mean, for a very long time, you had uh, somewhat like liberal uh, legal scholars or people like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I think her quote was something like, oh, it was you know, Roe v. Wade is this uh, uh, law that's sort of like it's just ready to rot away. Um, and part of the reason that, again, is it, it, you, you can, in the one hand, you know, be a court and say that we're not here really to be in the position of like establishing personhood or taking it away, but then just kind of de facto doing that, right? Because someone else could come along and say, well, I, you know, I disagree with this definition of person, which is, you know, more or less kind of like what happened, Right. Um, that uh, the, the, like in Alito's decision, uh, what he was making a distinction is it, it's not merely like it's not privacy for the sake of privacy. Uh, suddenly there's something else involved, right? If you are involving a person and, you know, the um, uh, Roe v. Wade sort of did uh, de facto establish personhood, even if they said that they weren't trying to, 
uh, well, if you have personhood now in this question, then privacy cannot merely be the thing that trumps everything. And um, I, like, I, I'm not sure if you've ever read like the Judah, Judah Thompson's A Defense of Abortion, but I would urge anybody watching this to read this like philosophical text. This was uh, written before Roe v. Wade. And she basically is from the very beginning, just to avoid the argument, she is allowing for the personhood of the fetus. And yet she's giving a really great argument for why it wouldn't even matter. So personally, with my own arguments, when I talk about abortion with people, for the sake of the argument, I just concede personhood just to begin with, even though I personally don't believe it, simply because there's a, there's these other arguments you can make right for abortion that have nothing to do with this question. So uh, I, I do think Roe uh, had built within it the sort of like, you know, it's the, the seeds of its own undoing, right? Which is, again, that's a pragmatic sort of critique. It's not a critique of abortion rights uh, in general, right? Well, but, one of the things, uh, the thing I wanted to mention that came back to me was, I hope that at the end of this process, 10, 15 years, whatever it takes to, to get abortion rights back, um, because I know people aren't going to vote third party and they're not going to, you're going to have mealy mouth, wishy washy, a piece of shit Democrats like Biden and Pelosi and Schumer. Um, but we need, absolutely need term limits, five year terms on the Supreme Court and, and, uh, and, you know, to just limit the damage that they can do. Um, you have to have a five year limits on it. Um, and, you know, I think, I think, uh, if you say something at uh, at uh, the the hearings for your confirmation, and it turns out that you actually have opinions, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, and 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 so I, I they they absolutely could be impeached. You know, I, I saw. Uh, I don't want to get off the topic, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think that needs to be done. You need to have more. Act. We have to. The idea of originalism has to be killed because as I quoted uh, in a couple of the amendments, the, the founding fathers, say what you will about them. They were old. They were white. They had dicks. They were, they were racist. They, they, a good portion of them were slaveholders. But in their defense, compare them to what was going on in Europe at the time. Compare them to the French. Compare them to the British. Compare them to the czars. They mm -hmm. were they were liberals back then. They were liberal and they were liberal enough. They were open minded enough that even through all their flaws, they knew that people 50, 100, 250, however many years this country lasted would be wiser. And there would be things that would come along. Remember, this was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Someone like Washington, born in 1740, and he died in what, 1802, 1806, something like that, lived 70 something years. He saw, well, could only, it would have blown the mind of his parents, the, the world that, you know, gin, uh, the cotton gin, this was a wonder thing. The, people don't realize how much life changed. These people were, they knew, uh, uh, even though Darwin didn't come along and publish for 60 some years, the idea of evolution was firmly planted in Thomas Jefferson's mind even though he sometimes didn't believe it, but these people were educated and they knew that things were going to change because things had changed radically in their lifetime. Let's talk about like kind of like the sort of wider view of, of uh, abortion and just politically what this all means. Like I How remember like- the great replacement theory? Oh yeah, so, some guy, some guy in the fucking like uh, Langan video. He deleted his comment when I asked him about it, but uh, he he wrote something like, "Well, I agree with Langan's take on the great uh, uh, replacement theory, right? Basically, the idea that white people are being." forcefully re replaced by uh, the various elites it could be jewish elites it could be like whoever um by by non-whites and i basically point out to him like well okay so white people are all around the world they make up what like seven percent of the world population and compared to everybody else they're having the fewest kids so i told him unless you're willing to like sire 500 children yourself don't fucking talk like what are you talking about right like you, you know this is this, this is just what it comes down to right um uh, you know the white white well, educated the, class that they don't want to have the, kids. The End is, of story. This is endemic in in Trumpism. It's endemic in Muskism. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll get we'll deal with that feckless asshole later. Um, but the whole idea that there's some kind of plan, well, take a fucking look, assholes. If you look percentage wise, Hispanics, blacks, non-whites have abortions at higher rates. 
these motherfuckers with this, what they are basically doing is they're emp they, they, they're empowering. If you take this little logical extension of, 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 of the real world here, you're going to have a lot more welfare queens mm -hmm. go back to the 1980s. We don't want welfare queens. We don't, you know, the, the corporations can savage and, and take 10,000 times what the worst welfare queen ever did, the handful that ever existed. A, a, but, a lot of a lot of like black right wingers, though, they're sort of using this as uh, they, they've always used abortion as like, oh, you know, this is just uh, another means of white people encouraging. Look like, a at mass, the statistics. A, a mass black, look at the statistics. Know? I'm going to have to I'm going to have to cut that out because the channel is going to get taken down. But it's like, yeah, you can't say that. You can't say it. No, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. No, you can't. It's unfortunate. But oh they already God. they already don't allow ads on Huck Finn because I'm literally reading out the fucking book, right? And <laughs> I'm not censoring it. But anyway, um, yeah. So like this has been used by uh, conservatives like uh, historically uh, to say, look, it's just you know genocide of, of black babies, right? Yet another thing that white people are doing. And I mean, I mean, obviously, there's no kind of like logical consistency here. But I, I remember reading um, an essay of yours, I believe it was like from maybe like 20 years ago or so, where you doubted that Roe v. Wade would ever be overturned simply because it would cause, you know, either like a mass exodus of uh, uh, women from the Republican Party. It would just be like a, a means of like Republicans uh, of overplaying their hand. Do you think this is in fact what would happen? Like, Were you surprised at this decision or what? Well, I was clearly wrong. Uh, th that, and I remember thinking that that uh, the first time when we discovered a, a livable planet, we'd have faster than light speed. That could still happen within a hundred years of that discovery, but I don't. I don't think think so. I, I think. I think. Uh, I I looked at Roe versus Wade as sort of like social security that would be third rail. But I think one of the things is uh, there has been. I, I, I discounted the role of ignorance and especially ignorance about science. Uh, the country, is, I mean, the very fact that we're doing this on YouTube, you know, uh, Cosmoetica, I, I couldn't launch Cosmoetica as it originally went on because people don't read anymore. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't not only read, don't read essays, they don't read novels. Uh, people have a hard time even, even reading the backs of uh, uh, products they buy at supermarkets or, mm -hmm. or dresses, you know, is it made of wool or is it made of uh, some kind of nylon? People don't care. They, I mean, you know, this is we have the TLDR. You know, too long did not read, don't read. We uh, uh, so what you happen, you you get people they'll watch a three minute video by uh, not the school of life, the Prager U. The school mm -hmm. of right life is a terrible left wing site, but Prager U is even worse on the right wing. They'll watch you know some bullshit cartoons, and this is one of the, people get their information about cartoons. Even even that that guy who, who that vlogger that historian vlog I sent to you a few years uh, a few weeks ago uh, uh, even he did a review of of a, a Mongol cartoon I'm like you're talking about the Mongol Empire as a historian and you're using cartoons mm -hmm. uh, I mean people that's just, that's just yeah that's that, that's that's to get people hooked on right because that's literally what they're going to pay attention to right yeah, I, know. I mean it, it, I mean they, people don't read they don't and so consequently you know the only way you can get them is, is is by these these arguments people this is why they're against vaccines now i could i could understand if you were black and you knew about the tuskegee uh stuff i could understand mm. maybe black people of a certain age being wary about yeah. taking vaccines but jenny mccarthy types Mm -hmm. No one's gonna. No one's gonna try to fuck up. You know, uh, an all-American, good-looking, boobalicious playboy playmate. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, you know, no one's gonna uh, try to fuck with. You know, these these rich white male uh, motherfuckers who sit in Congress. Uh, that uh, or, or you know the Idaho uh, state legislature or something. I mean, uh, people are so crazed, and they, you know, you will have. You will have people that will concede ninety nine percent of an argument, but they'll stick with the one percent that's clearly been wrong, and and they'll say, "Well, that disproves the ninety nine percent." And I, I I see this in in videos about about whether there's alien life there. I see it in all walks uh, online, uh, and so it, it's no uh, that. But in my defense, there was no way twenty years ago that I could have predicted even YouTube. You know. Uh, we were still in a place where people were reading. Like I said, 
Cosmo Weddock gets literally one one thousandth the, the views for my, my videos uh, than I did for my essays 15, 20 years ago. That's just the way it is because people don't want to, you know, what? people don't want to watch two talking heads like you or me or the people I interview on my Dan Schneider video interviews. They don't want to watch us talking about, you know, uh, uh, obscure scientific stuff, uh, legal stuff, uh, you know, uh, amendment auditors or whatever it might be. They, it, it's boring, but they, they, they want to see, you know, I, if I could show you, you, you're not on Facebook anymore. On my Facebook news, you know, we'll have, oh, uh, Trump this, uh, 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 Roe versus Wade this. That'll be two stories out of 20. The other 18 are is some Instagram girl, you know, does a nipple slip. <laughs> That's news on par with Trump stealing possibly nuclear documents. This is the world we live in in America. Hopefully it's better in Europe. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, like, what what do you think uh, is going to happen here? Like, so, first of all, uh, most people in America right now, uh, the polls are pretty clear, right? About, like, 60, 65% of them were against Roe v. Wade being overturned. Most people will want to uh, have abortions, right, if they're in a situation where they don't want to uh, take a pregnancy to term. Um, how do you think this is going to shake out? Because the Democrats seem to have been doing very, very poorly up until they're this feckless. thing, this thing was they're being impotent. handed to them. They're, they're feckless. They're impotent. You know, Joe Biden, a doddering old fool, you know, uh, I mean, the Democrats, I, I heard someone make an argument that in 1992, they wanted to codify Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, that there was movement. And, 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 and before you know, that as well. Like what? it's been and before that as well. Yeah, but they weren't serious attempts. You want to yeah. know why? Because they were lazy. They didn't think uh, about about the fact that since 1964, let's face fact, it's been almost 60 full years since Barry Goldwater lost. It was the Goldwater demolition by LBJ that led the to the long game. Democrats don't think long term. You know, uh, chip, 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 chip away at the rights, and then the whole thing falls. It's like it's like the the end of a glacier. It looks sturdy, but then boom, one thing can chip it away. You know, one a, a hot day, uh, you know, a, a walrus that's too heavy on a, a ledge or something. There, uh, they don't think in the long term. They don't care about the long term because all they want is the money. They actually emulate. And, and envy the Republicans. The Republicans sold out for money in the 1960s. The Democrats did it two, two decades later. And that's the big thing. AOC or any of her squad aren't going to do squat. AOC is now a, a devotee of Nancy Pelosi. Um, they're not going to do anything. They're going to. And in 1992, the thing that when they tried to codify, it was a half hearted effort. It wasn't going to happen. You want to know why? Because they knew that George uh, H.W. Bush was still in office when they tried, and he would have vetoed. Uh, he would have vetoed it even had they gotten it to his desk, which they didn't. This is what the Democrats do: they do these phony things. Oh, for forty-nine years we've had our fingers up our asses. Now we're going to do something now to codify. Where the fuck were you for half a century? You know, it, it, it's I, 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 and, I, I, and, and I, the, I wonder and, if it's just laziness or something else. So like, um, j just, uh, uh, like just thinking about it and how this has played out, especially in the last few months. Um, if you were a, if you were able to codify this as like a federal, you know, set of protections and abortion was like guaranteed for everybody, it would be very, very difficult to ever, you know, remove that. Suddenly, Democrats lose, you know, a major uh, kind of like reason for their fundraising. They, they're losing, you know, like what are they going to say about the Supreme Court, right? Most people don't seem to really care about the majority yeah. of the things in the Supreme Court. Ask but they, they, they could always hold, you know, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade, you have to vote, which in fact, which is what they're doing now. They're like, for us to reverse this, you have to vote for us in midterms. But what exactly is their plan, right? I don't see anything in the pipeline they don't. that they're doing. But most people don't, aren't going to care. Because the Democrats don't care. This, this is a great fundraiser for them. They're yeah. actually going to make a, bring in a lot more money. I just saw that Planned Parenthood is giving more, $52 million, more, more, more to advertise to, for laws, uh, you know, to give to mm -hmm. various groups. They, I mean, th this is a windfall for the Democrats. You know, you know uh, the idea that, that most Democrats are horrified is a load of shit. I'll tell you who's horrified. 
gay gay people, trans people. I worked at, at the store that I work at with a young trans man, 20 years old, woman who's, who's, who's you know, going to eventually transition to men. You know, she, uh, he, uh, when when the day this happened, came in on a break, it's like, because a lot of the young kids look up to me. Uh, uh, she's like, uh, he's like, I, I still do the he, she thing. Uh, Dan, what do, you, what do you think about this? And I talked with her, uh, him for about 20 some minutes. And, uh, you know, just to give a, a perspective that, you know, you know, a, a lot of the things we've been talking about. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, I did want to make one f other point, though, about uh, the originalism. And, no, like, and what, what, so, so why are they so alarmed? Like, what did you want to say about these uh, well, kids? What's, ne what's, what's next? Gay marriage. Gay marriage yeah, yeah. has been on the law for, what, seven years, six, Cl seven Clarence years? Tom has said this explicitly, right? He's looking at gay marriage. He's looking at contraceptives. And he's looking at uh, private sexual acts should not be deemed private, but should be <laughs> subject to uh, a legal disputes in the courts. I mean, this. let's not call him an <laughs> Let's call him a quizling. Can I say quizling? A black quizling. <laughs> Go ahead. He's a black quizling. You know, he's he's a slimy, low down piece of shit. He is he is the house servant. You know, he is what they would have called. I won't say the house n word. He is the house servant to all of these white. This guy is is a piece, and his wife is so tied up in his white wife. You know, and, and the one thing that probably, as long as Thomas is on the court, that will probably. <laughs> Uh, not be taken down is anti-miscegenation laws. But well, if mm -hmm. Thomas finally goes, then they might get a white guy who'll target that. But that's the one thing because it affects him because that motherfucker doesn't give a damn about anyone but Clarence Thomas. His, his uh, um, you know, his uh, uh, nomination to the Supreme Court was very funny in the sense that you know here, uh, so like in the '90s, we had uh, I'm not sure if it was peak political correctness hysteria. Right. But at least it was sort of like a revving up at, at that point. Um, and so he was nominated, obviously, by Republicans. And uh, he was sort of like universally seen as like uh, at that point, the least qualified would be, be Supreme Court justice ever, like in American history. But and they undershot him with Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 Democrats could not go out and make that argument because then it's sort of like, well, if you're the sort of like affirmative action party and you're saying that this is a, essentially an affirmative action pick. Right. So, you know, it was like it was a, it was a funny situation. And I'm and, sure Thomas knows he was nothing but a token. He didn't yeah. care because he got a lifetime appointment. You know, he got he got to be be known as the second black justice on the Supreme Court. Who gives a shit? If he, you know, uh, I I don't believe I can't believe that he doesn't realize how he's being used. He just doesn't care. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I mean, he gets I, to be a, he gets to be a celebrity, right? Yeah. Um, before I forget, I wanted to say one other thing about originalism that I pointed out. So, if we were to be originalists. There's no reason for the Supreme Court to do anything. The only thing the Supreme Court was established to do by the Constitution, and it's not even an amendment, was to, to review capital cases and other laws and decide who, which, which one won. It's appeals of, of, of that kind of law, not constitutional issues. 1796, the Supreme Court gave themselves the right to judicial review. Along with the corporate personhood thing, this is a very important thing because judicial review this was not this was not uh, done until 1796, eight years after, uh, well, 20 years after the founding, but eight years after the Constitution uh, came into being. Uh, so all of this stuff about originalism, if, if you really want to be an originalist, you have to wipe out any constitutionally related claims that the, 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 the Supreme Court has dealt with since 1796. So the very this is. It's so important is that our originalism is total bullshit. It is bunkum. It is it, it it has nothing to do with what the founders wanted. They knew the founders. The original intent was a wide and growing and encompassing, as they would say, a living, breathing document. That is American originalism, and it's embodied by the very fact that the Supreme Court recognized that by giving themselves the power to recognize rights and other thing and decide judicially so that that's another that's another thing when people say that that uh, abortion is in mention and the, the originalism we have to do this that uh, whatever bullshit we, 
Originalism is total bunkum and it's a total non-starter and it, it's just bullshit that the right wing trots out and they'd have no legal and no even grammatical basis for it if you read the goddamn constitution. Yeah, I mean, so like in general, like so, so much of this, I mean, I agree with the general thrust uh, of the comments that all, you know, all of this is just the means of uh controlling the body right uh there's like there's a t there and, and like there's no to, to get back to J judah thompson right her thought experiment uh in you know the philosophical field was um imagine that y you wake up one day and you're hooked up to a tiny violinist that needs your body right for the for like you know six nine months uh to, to survive in order to go on and do these like wonderful things uh later on in life right so it's like it's kind of funny how she sort of takes upon some of the uh conservative assumptions only to do uh, away with them down the road but anyway um uh there, like the point of that thought experiment is to say there's no analogous situation where you would allow anybody even if it's to to you know save someone's life that you would force someone to use your body for those ends. And the example that I often give is, you know, let's say that you're hanging out with a group of friends and you do something irresponsible, right? And the reason why I'm saying irresponsible is because conservatives say, well, if you have irresponsible sex and you have, uh, and you get pregnant, right? You have to deal with the consequences. Well, let's say you have a few friends over and you decide to do something irresponsible. You have like a sword hanging off your wall. And you decide to like, you know, take it off the wall and start doing all kinds of crazy shit with it, knowing full well that you could hurt someone and you end up slicing, you know, one of your friend's kidneys open. And the only way that that friend, right, could get a new kidney is if he takes yours. There's no court in America or most places in the world for that matter that would say you have to be tied down and your kidney has to be removed to uh, uh, you know, make good on this, you know, irresponsible act that you committed, you know, X time ago, right? It's, it would just be considered totally ridiculous. And the idea that, uh, this happens specifically, you know, to a woman, and this is why I would go back to this idea of the equal protection clause, right? Um, it's not enough to say, well, women just happen to be the ones that have to bring pregnancies to term, right? Uh, a woman also, you know, needs to work like anybody else. A woman also has a body like anybody else, right? It seems to me that equal protection under that sort of rubric, right, would, would demand would demand at the very least, like this idea that, well, this interferes with your job or anything for that matter. Right. Um, it's a violation of equal protection and just just the whole f idea that a, a row never really even cared enough to, to take those uh, arguments on. Right. It, it just seems like a wasted opportunity. And I do think it, it helped sort of uh, undo it, although, of course, like there would always be a pretext. Right. Conservatives uh, or rather right wing reactionaries would always seek some kind of pretext. Right. To overturn something like that. So. They just had a, a little bit of an easier time, I think, here uh, yeah, compared to alternatives. They, they they really are are arguing uh, and and using the Bible as something that could supersede the Constitution, which the Constitution uh, clearly separates church and state. So, if you Google, for example, the Bible mentions of abortion, uh, there is no there is no mention of abortion in, in the modern sense or even the former sense. But the one passage that stands out, and I want to read it. Uh, is from Exodus uh, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. So it says, and this is this new standard version, it's not the King James, but if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Uh, uh, so, um, they would argue, the right wing would argue that, uh, they're talking about the, that, that says, well, uh, the fetus is life, but it, it clearly doesn't there, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows the woman's husband. But if there's serious injury, you have to take a life for life. Others would argue that that would be, uh, that would be, uh, uh, the, the woman, uh, if she dies, that, that. That would be there. But even there, we're not talking about abortion. We're talking right there. It's it's a fight, and someone accidentally would hit a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. Now, none of this has anything to do constitutionally. But the the point to even just bring that up is is to show that these people, despite all their their claims of America first, they don't they don't love America. They don't care about this country. They don't care about the citizens of the country. They they are theocrats, and they are basically the the 
calling them the American Taliban is, is right on the money. They are people who would strip rights from women just as, as the Taliban does. They want them barefoot and pregnant, you know, on their knees to suck their cock when they get home. Uh, even if the guy has has warts on his dick from from fucking his mistress. From monkeypox, monkeypox. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, one thing I'll say about like, uh, the whole kind of like right-wing drift, uh, among Democrats and you alluded to this earlier, I mean, even Tim Kaine, right. Who was the, uh, VP pick for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, I, I wouldn't say that he's necessarily like anti-abortion, uh, in the same way that some of these other like, uh, right-wingers are, but he's had like, what's called like a complicated view, uh, on abortion in America. And if you're if you're a Democrat, right, and you have this like chronic willingness to sort of see this right wing drift and you're not you know, you're not putting your foot down um, and you're sort of allowing it to happen, like you, you're you always going to go at the pace of whatever the radical party is. If if Democrats were the radical party back in the 30s and 40s, well, guess what? The Republicans had to sort of, uh, you know, a tag along along the way. Right. Eisenhower did a bunch of uh, uh, social spending and, and public spending that would be considered unthinkable now because Democrats were doing it right. You had no choice. The 1956 Republican convention platform is far, farther left, not only for the Democrats, but it's probably on par with the Green Party. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and it, like, it makes me wonder, like, what is the best sort of historical analog or rather international analog for the Democratic Party now? Like when I look at uh, historically what happened in Israel, for example, between uh, the Labor Party, which was like ostensibly became uh, start as a socialist party. The first president of um, uh, Israel, Ben Gurion, was a, he called himself a socialist. But little by little. Right. There was no there was no distinction between uh, what one party, the other would do in terms of like their treatment of Palestinians to the point that right now you have you know, the Labor Party more or less doesn't even exist. Right. And when it comes to the individuals like within Israel, just like the ordinary voters, they have truly become crazier and crazier and more right wing over the years to the point where these other questions that we might talk about they're not even they're not even part of the conversation compared to how they were maybe like uh, in the 90s and i i see uh, perhaps something similar happening uh, to democrats right uh, maybe some of the like uh, some of the numerical su supremacy uh, might might be a cushion against this but with this kind of right wing drift and democrats just totally not taking any positions on Things like, you know, a minimum wage, right? You had out that opportunity. Eight Democratic senators voted against it, which makes you think how many other Democratic uh, party senators are there that would vote against it if they knew that there was any chance of it passing. It was probably closer to like 12, 15 or even something like 20. Who knows? But all these things are not taking positions on and they're sort of giving into the right wing argument. I mean, I, I can imagine a kind of like Israel like situation where the party just kind of dies. Right. And it will take a while for it to be replaced with something else. Uh, you know, again, the numer numerical supremacy might be a bit of a cushion, but it's not going to last forever. Right. I mean, Hispanics are now uh, becoming much more right wing. Right. Um, in terms of their voter preferences, black people since 2016, they're now little by little 2016 again. Again, in 2020, this is going to happen again in 2024. They are moving away from Democrats. They're still oh, you know, maj majority Democratic Party voters, but still. A year or two ago, you told me you didn't believe that as people get older, they get more right wing. I, I, I've i seen it. I, I pe On my Facebook page, uh, there are people that when when I was uh, in my early 20s, they were they were Democrats and they're still nominally Democrats. But they say some of the, the most repugnant things, especially when it comes to blacks and, and law and order and cops and the whole, uh, you know, the George Floyd thing. Were they like, different? Were they different? What? Were they always like that? They they when they were young, they were more open. Uh, I mean, you could see I, I could see some cracks here and there where it doesn't mm -hmm. surprise me. But but they don't even pretend anymore, even if they were pretending. Um and I, I've just seen that from from uh, from people who were adults when I was a child became worse over time, became more. Uh, I think it's just the natural part of, uh, of of as you get older, you know, you think more, more. Uh, his key, mm, uh, his very cute. baby, Kabiria, good girl. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I've seen it. So I, 
I, I disagree with what when you said that. I, I think if you come back in 20 years when you're in your mid 50s, you'll probably see that some of the people that, you know, were Marxists or what are you were Marxist. Yeah, I was a Marxist. I, so, I mean, like in, in that regard, although I, I wouldn't even say that really the core of my politics has really changed. Maybe some of the pragmatism has changed, like that sort of thing. But even, you know, some of the examples that you give about like people that you've known. What I could imagine in that situation, especially like in regards to like how they might view black people, like I could, I could imagine like a bunch of people, you know, that I grew up in Brooklyn, right? Maybe they were somewhat like open minded when it came to uh, black Americans. But as time went on, perhaps they as white Americans were doing better and better in life. And the black people that they knew, you know, maybe it's still the same housing projects. Maybe it's still the same cycle. If you have political leaders who are not willing to sort of break those cycles you as a white person who might not know any better, you'd be like, well, you know, I grew up and look, my life got better. Why are these people in that same situation? Like, I could imagine like a, a sort of like right wing pipeline being as simple as, you know, a party leaders are unwilling to change like whatever's causing those nuggets of stereotypes. You know what I mean? Well, the, the, the most uh, the most typed phrases uh, from from these people, uh, uh, just follow the law and you won't get hit by the cops. Just yeah. do what they say. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. And this this goes back to the Vietnam War. The hard hats who, who used to throw shit down at the kids protesting. Just do what we said. The person, the people who always say, "Just do what we say," is there is the proto fascist uh, idea, and that mm -hmm. people who who don't see this, they don't realize this. Um, you know, you have to say. Okay, maybe we should do what we say, but maybe we should change things too. Uh, and the people who are that are very, you know, people like me, uh, I are rare in the sense that I, I've gotten I, more left. But I can't even really say that because when 70% of people are pro abortion, despite the way people want to redefine it, who are for uh, basic income, who are for uh, Medicare for all, who are for uh, the Paris Accords, who are for, you know, the top 12, 15, quote unquote, liberal thing. They're getting 60 to 70 percent approval. Why the fuck do we have two right wing parties? The Democrats are farther right than the Tories in Britain in, in, yeah. a, in a lot of respects. Why do we have? Well, we, you can look about uh, uh, demographics and the way gerrymandering goes. I mean, you know, you I you want to get rid of stop gerrymandering. Just have have you know if, if a state has five districts and six hundred thousand per district, take the lines and say, okay, here's the first six hundred thousand about, and just do it on a map. Don't be making these you know uh, Lego type uh, uh, congressional districts. Uh, let let the things play out. G give give people the chance to be a power. But people aren't going to do that. Um, uh, but uh, I, let's talk also before we, I forget about about the pre row stuff. And uh, yeah, so, so so like I mean, like uh, specifically for people that don't know, like uh, I, I think Dan's uh, uh, you know unique contribution here would be the fact that. I mean, he's he was around, right? Um, uh, pre row he had a, a a kind of like rich early life among gangsters, and he saw prostitutes getting abortions. He saw like failed abortions, right, and, and every kind of like spectrum in in between. So, why don't you talk about uh, some of those realities and maybe some of the realities that will start coming back, right, with this decision? So, I had just turned eight when abortion was out for my so for seven years. You can throw away the first four, four and a half years. For about two and a half, three full years, whatever it was, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in the Ridgewood section of New York. If you look on a map, here's Queens, uh, kind of, well, I, I guess it would be, well, here's yeah. Queens, and then here's, Bro here's Brooklyn over here, and there's, you know, the line basically runs almost, almost straight. It, it varies a couple of blocks here or there. On the Brooklyn side of Ridgewood was Bushwick. And in the 1960s, 70s, Bushwick was like the South Bronx and that it looked like Lebanon, you know, burned out buildings and whatnot. And so when I was a kid, I lived just one block up from the border. So me and my friends would go and play. We would play with some of the, the, the kids uh, across the border who were black. I mean, literally, there wasn't a fence, but across what would have been, I think, Wyckoff Avenue uh, and then Cypress Avenue were the two main avenues. Uh, Black people lived on one side, white people lived on the other side. And along Wyckoff Avenue especially, 
There were a lot of prostitutes who, who worked there. There were gangsters. Uh, this was also Wyckoff Heights Hospital, I believe, was, was the name of the hospital. There. It's probably still there. Um, uh, there was, uh, there was a methadone clinic for drug addicts. And in these burnt out buildings, and I wrote about this in True Life, me and my friends would often play. We'd play in the, these heroin galleries. What's a heroin gallery? Heroin galleries are where heroin pe people who shot up heroin back in the 60s and 70s would just shoot all, up all day. And they would lay around in these buildings. Uh, they looked like what would later, later, uh, later be uh, people who had AIDS crossed with lepers because their skin would take so much, uh, so many shots of, of, of the heroin that they would just become pustules. In here, this is where the prostitutes were, and you would have cars driving by cruising, just like in uh, uh, in Taxi Driver. You would see, you know, a uh, guy come by. So young young kids like me, the prostitutes would be back in the hours, not necessarily out there, obviously street walking. They'd be back in the hours. The cars would, would go by. Prostitute would say, here, I'll give you a, a, a quarter. A quarter in 1970, could get me a 15 cent comic, could get me a soda for 10 cents or, you know, a water. And so we go out and we'd see the Johns. We go, hey, you know, uh, there's a girl back there. Take a look. You know, and she'd come out and, you know, she'd, she'd, you know, stand sexy or whatnot, prostitute sexy, drop her drawers or whatnot, show her goods. And if the guy said, yeah, get her in the car, I'd say, I'd, I'd run back. They'd give me the quarter. The girl would go and whatnot. So there were also homeless people uh, that lived underneath the subway a block or two from where I lived. And these were people that were literally home. The very, uh, there was even an underground fire and I had the, the hair burned off of my leg uh, uh, because of that underground fire with these homeless people. And these were some of the people who would end up in the, the abortion mill there. Now, uh, this, was, this was just like, I think I've mentioned how there were gay bars who were all windows boarded up. This was a boarded up building. You'd go in the back, go down underneath. And this was run. This was run by a politician that I called John Doe. I won't re use his real name, but the son of a bitch is still alive. <laughs> He's pushing, <laughs> making a hard push towards 100. But this guy was the quintessential Republican uh, or right wing anti-abortion a guy, you know, oh, we're for family. I'm against abortion. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm for the family. Yet he himself, and I know because one of the girls there was a couple of years older than him. There was a young girl who she wasn't a prostitute, although he did, he did often beat up prostitutes and 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 he he fucking uh, take cigarette butts and and uh, or lit cigarettes rather and and try to uh, abuse their uh, vaginal parts. But there was one girl who lived on my block later in Glendale who became involved when she was like 16 with this politician, had a, had a got pregnant and had a back alley abortion here. Now, there were, there were women that I would see and you, they would come out and their friend would be with them or something. And you, know, you could see a dark stain, let's say, uh, uh, in their jeans or their pants, whatever they were wearing. Uh, sometimes you would hear about, you know, women being found just uh, literally... Uh, a block or two away, they they walk and, and barely make it. This guy, uh, who was the politician, himself had his own private doctor because he had he had money involved in this abortion mill. Uh, there were other ones that I heard about, but this is the one that was only two or three blocks from where I was on Wyckoff Avenue, and uh, it, it was it was terrible because sometimes you know you might hear that's using name Kathy, who you knew from around the area. Uh, oh, Kathy. Uh, uh, you know, she she died or something. And you'd hear, hear oh, how did she die? Oh, she went to that place, the, the, the abortion mill, uh, uh, and it, it didn't, didn't make it or whatnot. Now, people would say, well, these people shouldn't be, sh shouldn't be selling their bodies. These girls are, you know, they're, you know, this, that, or other thing. Even though the Bible, if you want to believe it, Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene, I mean, you know, uh, but uh, they're, this this would happen on on a regular day. I'm not every day, obviously, but you know, every month or so, you might hear about something that happened. There. Over the course of three years, there were a few dozen females, most of them poor, most of them either homeless who lived in the subway or prostitutes. The the girls who wanted to get an abortion came from better families, but usually better than where I live. They would go to Scarsdale, or they would go out onto Suffolk, or they would go 
to New Jersey or wherever you know, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, that uh, they they could go whatever states might have been different. I I, I don't know the the laws of Connecticut uh, and New Jersey and whatnot, but this this would happen all the time. Now uh, in New York, I it may have been at, at some point that some things were legal, but the point is it wasn't freely legal, and mm-hmm. therefore. Uh, or, or totally legal, all, all abortions at all times. And therefore, you would ha- have these things. Again, I'm not sure about uh, if New York, it was totally illegal, because when Roe came along, I don't think there was no such thing as a national ban, as far as I know. Each state decided. I think New York, it, most of it was. I think they did have rape and incest, uh, you know, ex- exceptions and life of the mother kind of thing. But again, most most abortions, you know, you're not going to have life of the mother unless it's an ectopic pregnancy at, at eight to twelve weeks or something. So uh, that that happened all the time. And again, this politician who was a right wing guy, who was law and order, family, who was I'm not going to give any more details because people could figure it out. Uh, this guy was fucking young girls, not only prostitutes here and there, but quote unquote good girls getting them pregnant, sending them to this place that he had an interest in, who, who, who was the financial back. And the guy was an Indian or Pakistani doctor who probably got you know his, his degree off uh, the, the Indian equivalent of uh, a, a, you know, Kellogg cereal or something. But uh, it, it, was just, it was just ridiculous. And no one cared about it in those days. No one cared about it. And even those people who cared about the occasional middle class or rich girl who had uh, an abor- abortion mishap or, or, or had gone to this because they didn't want their parents to know so they didn't they didn't you know maximize or get the best doctors themselves those those who were the underclass no one cared about it and that's the way it, it, it's it's going to go hopefully it doesn't get so bad hopefully in the next year or two something will happen that will will uh do this but i'm, I'm in the short term it, i think it's pretty bleak yeah um yeah i could definitely imagine uh uh there there, there's probably going to be some events right like people don't really tend to pay attention all that much until you know like we we mentioned before like um uh uh if if you have like a a boxing ring or like with a with like a between a woman and you know maybe like a a a former male right that's transitioned you're you're gonna get some sort of situation eventually where there's gonna be a literal like death uh within a a boxing ring or whatever it might be uh same and people will take notice then they'll be like okay well maybe we should reconsider maybe readjust some of these rules you're probably going to find especially now since like information is is easier and easier to come by you're going to get a couple things happening one you're going to have examples of women dying right due to uh botched abortions or whatever it might be and the secondary part and i think this will be kind of like uh funny to see you're probably going to get a ton of politicians that are like uh, uh very kind of like vocally uh anti-abortion they're going to get entangled with like mistresses they're going to be entangled with abortions in their own lives i've known people you know that worked in um uh, abortion clinics that were being picketed or whatever being protested uh by, by uh, various right-wing activists and like a, a week later, right? They'd see some of the girls are out there coming for their own abortions, right? Everybody in that situation, they're like, you know, abortion should be illegal. But in my particular case, right, there's always that uh, universalizing, uh, rather like anti-universalizing. In my particular case, right, it was fine, right? I had a reason for a blah blah blah. So, but g- given with the way that information travels these days compared to a few decades ago, um, th- th- this thing might might get to some sort of like little explosive moment, and then uh readjust itself a lot faster right we probably won't have a, a a slow boil i gave i gave you the the uh the pre-row thing then for a number of years i had moved to another neighborhood in 74 a year after row and that's actually in the late 70s was when uh the, the girl uh the girl who uh, uh the politician had uh, impregnated that's when that happened it was legal to have an abortion um uh, and he forced it to, and I, I don't believe she went to his clinic. But mm-hmm. um, I've mentioned uh, before in my writing, uh, in, in when I was in, a, in the Hispanic gang in high school, there were two, there were a lot of prostitutes that came and went, but there were two of them that were friends. One was named Migdalia, and the other was named Carmen. Migdalia was a little bit older, 
Uh, she was very actually quite beautiful, ethereal looking uh, Hispanic girl. Um, Carmen, even though she was about six months or a year or so younger, was was not as good looking and actually looked quite three or four years older because she was very, I think he had probably been on the streets longer. So two things happened. I want to talk about both of them in, in respect to abortion. The first one is uh, Medallia did have an abortion uh, and I escorted her to a clinic uh, that's probably generally within where, near where you live. Um, and then uh, Medallia actually had, was pregnant and miscarried. I want to talk about, uh, not Medallia, Carmen. Regarding Carmen, she, because she was a Catholic and she was a practicing Catholic and she felt bad about the miscarriage, uh, she wanted to bury her quote unquote baby. So when I got to the place where she and Magdalia lived with a, a few other girls, they had this bloody thing. And so <laughs> you're looking through, you, you, you know, you need almost a fucking microscope to see this human being. Uh, and so if you look here and I'll put it up, uh, there's my pinky. Whoops. What the fuck? No, it was there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's it. my pinky nail. That pinky nail was probably not only the, the fetus, but because inside the red blotch, you could see an almost black thing. And that that's that's what the fetus was at that point. So it was probably, again, the size of an insect, a, a, a small bug, uh, if that. And to bury it, what are we going to use? Well, we use a fucking Coca-Cola bottle. So I remember taking my thing, my finger, and and <laughs> jamming the fetus in there, putting it up. We went to one of the Rockaways. I think it was Far Rockaway. We took the we took uh, whatever I, I, whatever train goes to Rockaway. We, we walked. We went on the beach. The girls did their hosannas, the Catholic bullshit, and uh, I buried it. And you know, my point to bring that up, even though it wasn't abortion, is you know, look at your fucking pinky nail. How many fucking human beings that are half an inch long are there? Have you ever had a good discussion with a half inch tall human being? Have you ever have you ever grown affection for a half inch tall human being? No, because they don't have the ability to talk. They don't have the ability uh, to reason. They have no cognition. They have barely uh, any functioning parts. Putting aside the idea that they are a part of the mother's body, which when we end this, we need to talk about 50 years from now uh, uh, when mm -hmm. uh, that happens, uh, fetus can be gone, can be raised extra utero. But the second thing, Migdalia. Now, Migdalia, she had an abortion and uh, amongst, amongst many things, it, this probably led to her death, although I never saw her body. Uh, she was forced to have an abortion uh, she would have had it herself, but her her pimp. And before, before I play into the Jody Force stereotypes, I'm pro sex worker. Uh, five to ten percent of prostitutes in America have been streetwalkers. The other ninety percent have been invisibly hidden. So I, I'm not I'm not begging the. But this this was a, a this this guy was a son of a bitch who forced uh, her or made it clear that she needed to have an abortion. So. We went to this place, which was a medical building. Again, as I said, uh, somewhere near where you reside now. Uh, and I remember I walked her up and uh, uh, I borrowed, I think I borrowed someone's car. We didn't take the train. I think I borrowed someone's car or well, someone drove us there. And we, we were dropped off about three or four blocks away so that they couldn't get the car license number. Because this is what these motherfuckers did. They would get the license numbers of cars and then harass, find out where this person lived and harass them. Now, it wouldn't have mattered in this case because this was someone else's car. So we're walking there and there are these people, you know, holding the things. There's barricades uh, there. This is 1981 or 82. I was 16 or 17. And I probably walked six, seven times, no more than eight or 10 at the most, maybe only four or five. It's hard to remember. But I remember Magdalia's one because that was... I was closer to her, and also this was where the incident happened. There's this big, corpulent, fat fuck, white guy, probably at the time 42, 45, probably younger than 50, and they're all chanting their bullshit, you know, with the, they got the signs, and you had to go up about seven or eight step, uh, steps to get to the, the door, and as we're coming, you know, 
uh, someone is that they, they, they miss they miss us, but they're like tossing like ketchup, you know, onto this the stairs. The fat fuck comes up thinking he can intimidate her. Now I'm not I'm not trying to sound like I'm uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, but but it was one of my best shots when the guy came up there. I remember just sticking out and boom, and, and just just hitting him. I guess it was in the solar plexus or maybe the upper chest, and the the fat guy was was like Humpty Dumpty, just a round piece of shit. And he fell back down the four or five steps onto his ass. And we went in an hour, two hours, whatever it was uh, uh, later. The sun, you know, it was uh, the procedure itself was perfectly normal. There was no complications or whatnot. We're coming out. They're still there. And I remember when I and she walked away. There was there was a, a silence. There was a kind of like, oh wait, let's let's not get... because even though I was only a teenager, uh, they saw that I fought back against them. And this is a lesson to be learned. Uh, you know, everyone says never again. You know, the whole, whole Holocaust thing. Even though many genocides happen, never again. It'll always happen again unless you stand up and you have you have to stand up against people who want to take your rights, people who want to intimidate you, people who want to commit whatever crimes they have uh, in, in their mind to you. If you stand up, people will take notice because unfortunately, we still live in a world where violence is, is the universal language. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing. It's not something that I. I'm saying to, to say, oh, I stood up against, you know, these these stupid son of a bitches. But look at the Democratic Party. They are, I call them the Vichy Democrats. I call them collaborationists for the last 40 years, not only on abortion, but on all things pertaining to uh, civil rights. The Democrats have not given a flying fuck. And, and, and if a 16, 17 year old boy like me who, you know, I wasn't that big, I wasn't that strong, just stands up and says, no, that's not going to happen. It's not going to stop the whole movement, but it will put a little bit of fear in them. And that's, what the, these people, these people are, I, I say they have always been domestic terrorists. And, and, you know, the only way sometimes is to fight fire with fire. It's a cliche, but that's, so those are the two things. Uh, the, the Carmen miscarry, people aren't the size of, of pinky nails. And you have to stand up for yourself because if you're not willing to stand up for yourself and hopefully most women will get, get motivated because men aren't going to do it. Women have to be the ones at the forefront saying, fuck no, we're not going back to abortion mills. We're not going back. Just the way blacks have to be the people that say, fuck no, we're going back. And you can look, you can look. Uh, Japanese Americans, after they were interned, you know, they basically uh, fought for 45, 50 years they got their slight reparations, but they stood up. And I see, you know, I I can't say totally with, with the, the way the right wing is here, but it would be very difficult to find uh, anyone willing to intern any kind of group. Look, look the Muslims evaded being interned after 9-11. So I think, I, I think the, a lesson from Japanese internment is to stand up. And when you stand up, a lot of these cowards are going to back down. Uh, and I've seen it, in, in, however micro a situation that was forty some years ago. Yeah, it's 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 funny to watch the sort of kind of like recent uh, recruitment by those who are kind of like Democratic Party aligned, Democratic Party adjacent, or just like pure Democrats, right? They're doing a lot of like academic work in the last like five ten years, just like writing these like really misleading books about the role of things like violence or force or whatever in you know various like either civil rights movements or liberation movements to really just undersell how necessary you know a lot i mean like look at something like climate change i mean uh we're, we are heading uh, very clearly to at the very least like say what you will about the environment in general but maybe two three billion at least climate change refugees right? That's going to put, you know, a ton of pressure. That's going to cause tons of violence. That will probably be, you know, the only thing that could really sort of uh, change things around, right? Because, uh, you know, elites are going to be comfortable pretty much the very until the very end. I don't see that, that ever changing. And that goes for all questions, abortion, climate, whatever, right? It's always like that. And, and always, wa know, always watch out when people try to oversell how, you know, a nonviolence and anti-violence 
uh, works in these movies because it's always a, a very hard oversell of those uh, portions yeah. of it. People like to rate. People want to raise Martin Luther King up, uh, but, but Martin Luther King had Malcolm X behind him. You know, he was the big threat there. But um, you also have to, to, to be forthright about what you're saying. One of the things that I really don't like about feckless uh, pro-choices is say what it is. You're not talking about free Congolian for all. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm you, pro-abortion. Abortion is safe. Abortion is a necessary thing for uh, uh, for for uh, some uh, for some pregnancies, and abortion is a good birth control. It's and uh, it's not a moral question, right? Say the word abortion. Yeah. Say it. I am pro-abortion. Yes, technically I'm pro-choice. It's like the atheist agnostic thing, you know. Uh, but I am pro-abortion. I think there should be more abortion. I think we shouldn't have 8 billion people. Yes, we could have 40 or 50 billion people sustained here if we lived in a utopian paradise. That ain't coming. Not coming anytime soon. We need less than 8 billion people. Go back to about two and a half, three billion 3 billion when, when I was a, a young boy in the 60s and 70s. That's about, uh, about right. You don't need that many. Uh, that's going to be that, the population I, of Canada alone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I bring that up simply because I know you had other notes. So I don't know what else you wanted to talk to from your notes. All right. So there's this article. Uh, this was back back in July, right? It was just, it was ridiculous to read it then. It's going to be ridiculous to read it now. But there's this uh, woman um, named Leah Libresco Sargent, right? And it's titled, In a Post-Row World, We Can Avoid Pitting Mothers Against Babies. Right. Uh, she thinks she thinks this is kind of like the stakes of, of uh, what we should be discussing that post row. The, the issue is uh, we need to avoid pitting mothers against babies. Keep in mind. So she's describing an ectopic uh, a pregnancy and what the solution for that, of course, is abortion. Right. But this this word, right, is not is not really mentioned in reference to herself at any point. Right. So uh, I found that a funny little uh, uh question here right so she writes now that the supreme court has overturned roe v wade states face a new reality about where to draw the line in pregnancy for where abortion is permitted in these debates ectopic pregnancy is a key issue and in ectopic pregnancy the baby implants somewhere other than the uterus usually in a fallopian tube the situation is fatal for the baby it's also dangerous for the mother the fallopian tube can rupture and the bleeding can be so fast and so sudden that it puts the mother's life at risk Right. Um, so she's already saying baby. It's a fetus. It's yeah, not exactly, a fetus. exactly. Exactly. So pro-life doctors and pro-life ethicists agree it is morally licit to save a mother's life, even at her baby's expense. But they draw a distinction between the treatment for ectopic pregnancy and an abortion. So for like, first of all, she's like she's doing this crazy. It's a crazy as a woman, right? A crazy appeal to what is primarily male authority, right? Yeah. She needs to have some pro-life doctor or some pro-life ethicist to tell her that this is in any way permissible to do this thing with her body. Right. Um, and, and I would also I also wonder, right, uh, I, I, I've seen this argument all the time, right, that, well, you know, abortion is murder in every case except to save the life of the mother. And I've, I've honestly never truly understood that either. Right. If it's murder in one case and you have this innocent party, uh, if this baby, if you call this a baby, first of all, and you say that this baby, if brought to term, will have this wonderful, you know, uh, boundless future. Um, why are you going to, these are the terms of the debate. Why would you save uh, a mother, right? Who's already lived out half her life, right? And is now like fulfilling her true duty, which is to be a baby factory. Why is she treated preferentially over this uh, child, right? So I've never understood that. But anyway, from a pro-life perspective, delivering a baby who is ectopic is closer to delivering a baby very prematurely because the mother has life-threatening eclampsia. A baby delivered at 22 weeks may or may not survive. A baby delivered in the first trimester because of an ectopic pregnancy definitely won't survive. But in both cases, a pro-life doctor sees herself as delivering a child who is as much a patient as the mother. So this is the core of her like pitting babies against mother's uh, argument, right? When she goes and she gets her own abortion, she wants to be seen by a pro-life doctor, right? Who says, this is your child. I'm going to maybe pray over your child. I'm delivering your child and you will get to see your child, right? This is not some sort of virus inside you that needs to be killed here's off. The thing, here's the thing that gets me. This points back to the Democrats and being feckless is 
Stop using their arguments and arguing on their turf. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to... I'm not going to argue with with uh, an anti-abortion person and call them uh, a pro-lifer. You're not pro-life. You're anti-abortion. Again, just like I am pro-abortion. You're pro-abortion. I'm anti-abortion. I'm not going to accept your bullshit, whether it's on abortion or whether it's on, on whether God exists or not. Okay, I'm going to talk about what we know scientifically or, 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 or empirically or materially. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I was, I, I've had arguments with people I was talking about with a near death person. And, you know, I had quote unquote a near death experience, but I'm smart enough to know that I didn't, I, I didn't see God or what I didn't see it within the thing. But even if I had seen God or something that I really wasn't seeing God, it's something that comes to mind. People have got to stop this, this, this fake polity, this fake politeness here. When you are, are saying, I'm going to take away someone's right here because you know, it's important for me to know that my 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 country follows Christian values. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about your Christian values. I don't give a fuck about what what you're doing when you're trying to take away rights. When 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 you're trying to to justify the beating of black people because oh a guy was once a drug dealer or a guy once once uh, robbed a liquor store twenty five years ago. That's not enough to kill someone. I'm not going to to, to concede. Uh, some bullshit point when when you want to get rid of gay marriage or, or send fear into trans people just because, oh, you can do it. No, people have got to stop this arguing about things. You know, if you want to talk about Jesus Christ and whatnot, we're going to talk on a historical perspective. We're not going to talk, I'm not going to concede that Jesus w w was ever real because there isn't any hist historicity for Jesus. Uh, and people have got to stop doing this, the same thing with abortion. Uh, stop. Who gives a fuck what a pro-life doctor does? First of all, he's not pro-life. And then he's obviously a bad doctor since he doesn't think since he thinks that a fetus is a baby. So, you know, that right there, I'm not going to give a shit what that kind of a doctor thinks. Think about how highfalutin, you know, some of this terminology is like uh, the the anti-abortionists get to call themselves pro-life, right? Which, you know, who could possibly disagree, Dan, with being pro-life? Who's against life? Whereas, you know, uh, if you're for abortion, you're relegated to this totally What would you non, think about abortion if your mother aborted you? This is yeah, the kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be here. I'd yeah, have I no thoughts. I I, 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 remember, I, I I remember one time dating uh, a, a, like a conservative like Catholic girl uh, when I was a teenager. And she was like, you know, I used to be on the fence about abortion. But then one of my best friends told me that her mother thought about having an abortion. when She was pregnant with her. And I was like, oh, my God, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, have the chance to ever know my best friend. She thought that was like a legitimate argument uh, against abortion. So where are we? So, okay. So a pro-life approach to ectopic pregnancy, like what, what a weird phrase, a pro-life ap approach to abortion. That's literally what she's saying, a pro-life approach to abortion, because this is the solution to these pregnancies. It's it not may, anything else. It may countenance. Look at that. Yeah. It may iffy and then countenance using a very biblical word. Is this, is, see, this is the kind of person who probably thinks they're a liberal when they're 25, but she'll come out, she'll come out as a, at 45 or 50 as be, being on the right. So she's talking, so like the end of it, she's, she's just talking about like a doctor coming in, expressing his condolences. Well, I mean, this is just like ordinary bedside manner, right? But the thing is, she's not talking about doctors here. Doctors need to cultivate a better bedside manner, right? This is obviously true, right? Doctors are often very bad at this, but uh this this isn't what the article is about the article is just kind of like a a way to whitewash right her own abortion right and i'm using whitewash in the kind of sardonic sense i don't oh, believe she had I, an abortion I, it sounds like there was a miscarriage i thought well uh well in in this uh now when she's she's asking for the ultrasonic where are you looking for this uh child right uh she's then told this is an ectopic pregnancy you're gonna have to now you know get an abortion to essentially uh, oh and that brings up another point let me make save your life point. right when some when someone has a botched abortion or an abortion done by one of these uh butchers it makes miscarriages years later all the more likely so exactly when, if you have a 16 year old girl who gets pregnant and she's too young and her parents say, oh, you know, Missy or whatnot, we, we support you or whatnot. She goes to a, she goes to Planned Parenthood. 
has a nice safe procedure, no problem. Ten years later, she meets Mr. Wonderful, gets married, has a good job. He's got a good job. They got a home in whatever suburb. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. But you force that girl at 16 to go to a back alley butcher who is going to be like this guy I mentioned who got his degree probably off a cereal box or something. Now, Mm -hmm. something's wrong with her fallopian tubes or their scar tissue caused by... uh, uh, or she might have she might have had some life threatening thing where she had to have a hysterectomy because not all of the uh, what what's the thing around the fetus um the Hollywood celebrities eat the placenta the oh, placenta that. not all the placenta was removed and so it rotted inside of her and she she can't have kids there's all kinds of complications uh, because you're now sending women to these to these uh, back alley butchers in states that don't allow for abortions it's fucking insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there, there's not too much to say here, except I mean, uh, look, 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 look at the terms that she's so she she gets home. Right. And she has that uh, essentially that placenta. Uh, we didn't get to bury our baby. My husband didn't have to bury me. Uh, our surgeon had been right. Our baby had died some time ago and all he could do was find the placenta. But while I recovered at home, we had something to know our baby by. We named this child Chameleon after St. Camillus de Lelis. He was a 16th century gambler who was treated so poorly by his doctors that he founded a nursing order and ultimately became a priest and a saint, right? So, I mean, like, all, all the way to the very end, right, it's just, it's just this kind of, like, ideological strategy to avoid dealing with the facts, right? I mean, most people that get abortions, they don't name their abortions, right? They don't dub it uh, with anything, right? But here... Right. Because this this in her mind, right, it has to not be an abortion. You can't use that dirty, 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 dirty word. Right. The best thing you could do now is not only to not use that dirty word, but to also uh, give this uh, placenta essentially a, a name. Right. Anyway, it's just it's just it's just such insanity. Right. I don't you know, I honestly don't even know what else to say about um, uh, about that. I saw the line. Doctors can't value their women by saying their baby is worthless. Well, it's not a baby. And no one's saying it's worthless. If you want to, if 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 you're two or three months pregnant and you want to say that you know your baby is named Camilla or Bubba, it you know fine. But it, it, the idea that's just personification. You know, I yeah. I name this cat Kabiria, and she's at my feet, and she's my baby. I call her my baby, and but I recognize too. I mean, she but she's a little. She has more right than your typical. Uh, well, any fetus. That's, she, and that's she, literally true. Said, like people might find that inflammatory, but that's literally true. A living cat has laws preventing it from being abused arbitrarily, right? Yeah. A zygote does doing? not. Yeah. Now what? What? Here's something that she can do without any problem. Now, she just respired. She just took in a breath and exhaled. Mm-hmm. A fetus can't do that. And even a fetus that, that's seven, seven or eight months old has to respire through the mother. So... Again, you're reducing the mother, the woman, to basically being, you know, a glorified uh, baby factory, you know. Uh, and, and why would you want to do that? These people, and this is why people are right when they say it's not just about abortion. It's about putting women back into into the kitchen, uh, you know, ceding their life to their male. It's about it's about uh, all these other things that are going to be attended. Uh, getting you know uh let now we're gonna go after the queers uh then after them we're gonna we're gonna go back after the blacks or whatnot you know we're not gonna be con- content with just killing them randomly uh every time they get out of line and give lip to a fucking cop we're gonna you know actually do whatever they have they have in their end game so that's why you have to stand up for it that's why it doesn't matter you know it you can stand up. We're standing up here by having a show like this. You don't have to necessarily go out and protest. You don't necessarily have to kick some fat fuck down four or five steps because he, he's charging at a, a woman wanted to go abortion. But you have to stand up, go to the ballot box, vote, and, and stop listening to people who, who are like this mealy mouth woman you just quoted from. You know, there there are certain things. And being pro-abortion is the right side. It's medically, it's scientifically, it's ethically. And if you believe in morals, which I don't because they're religiously based, it's the moral thing to do. Because if you don't, more women are going to die. They will die. 
you are basically then telling young, poor, uh, minority women mostly uh, uh, that their lives don't matter. But, but if you think about it, what's to say that that fetus isn't going to be that girl in 15 or 16 years that's pregnant? You know, uh, do, does that, when, when that, that girl who's going to have an abortion was a fetus, she was worth more? You would, think that, you would think that as you go from fetus to being born, to being a baby, to being a tot, a toddler, a youth, and then reaching the age of majority, you would think that as your cognition expands, as you get smarter, as you develop sexual, that you should be, be valued more. I, you know, it, if, I, if, I, if I could go back 47 years or so when Jessica was a fetus and say, oh, there's my future wife inside her, preg uh, her, her birth mother. Jessica's adopted like I am, so she doesn't know. Uh, and then compare her to Jessica and all Jessica's done, all the stuff she's written, all the great stuff she's written. Fetus, accomplished human being. Yeah. How, how do you even make that kind of equation? And anybody that denies this, uh, you know, they're only denying it in that kind of a 0.0001% of the life when they're actually asked that question. They go around, you know, in their everyday lives, assuming that what you just said, Dan, is absolutely true, right? They would, you know, granted, there's, I'm sure this woman, you know, felt sad about this ectopic pregnancy. I'm sure she felt sad about like a previous miscarriage, but I guarantee you she would feel much sadder about losing like a two year old versus, you know, a 10 year old versus her husband, right? Yeah. And uh, the law, the laws, like that's the crazy part. Everywhere historically, anywhere that you look, the laws are always sort of set around these facts, right? Abortions were rarely treated in the same way that murder was, right? Very often, it would go down to like when you when you quote it from the Bible, you know, with the husband would say simply because you know this would be the question: Do you want to have this child? Yes or no? If in any way the answer was no, these punishments would be lighter, right? It's kind, you know, uh, it's kind of like you know if you're walking down, if someone's walking down the street and they assault a pregnant woman uh that uh that's obviously like very different stakes right if she wants to get abortion versus not right but in no case it would be considered a murder and and, and even again people like ben shapiro who would suggest otherwise they still are not willing to prosecute women and of course it's always some sort of infantilizing argument um, last, last point that the last thing i got i saw something the other day uh idaho has a trigger law uh th that protects uh uh, that protects the quote unquote fetus, even if it's rape. Now the rapist can't, the rapist can't force the woman to have, uh, to, to bring the to term. Uh, but Idaho law, I think it's Idaho states that the rapist family has the, the family of a rapist has more right to see their progeny be born than the woman has control of her body. This is, this is, this is even far beyond this, uh, People are quoting the the Handmaid's Tale, or they're quoting the the what's his name, uh, Philip K. Dix, the Man in the High Mountain, or whatever the mm -hmm. fuck you know. They, they're quoting all of these doomsday scenarios or whatnot. But that's even farther along than those two cases. Yeah, and I mean, if you just think about it, just like especially if you apply this to any other situation, like you see like cats on the street. Imagine some freak is like cats like we need more cats more cats we need to get them pregnant again and again and again there's, there's just something so sick about this idea of you know uh, let's produce more babies more babies more babies and of course like you know everything is just straining right everything is straining under a lack of resources everything is straining from overpopulation and it's you know, underpopulation, according to Elon Musk. Yeah. Nice segue. Yeah, the, the, this the, the, you know it, it's 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 just it's just, are, it's just some sick shit um uh, but but anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna just go through these other shows systematically. So I guess I'm gonna end this. Uh, I guess this was artifact number twenty nine. Thank you for uh, watching, listening, whatever we are, uh, wherever you get your podcast from. Just type in artifact books, art, and culture, and you will find it. Um, also have a Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash automachination. If you want to get exclusive videos, not available to the public. Um, and as far as the public goes, also automachination.com for all of your literary needs. And we'll come back with another video.